Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics Foundation Series. This is the rhombus experiment theory video. Over 20 years ago, I rationalized that classical theory does not adequately explain the phenomenon of self-induction. From the quad loop, which was originally the dual loop experiment, it shows at the very least that the attempt to explain the something else was gibberish. But it also really shows that the rest of it's gibberish. So the course of action I took 20 years ago was a fresh start. Let's assume that theory is completely wrong. Let's not use it in any way. And let's just do some experiments and try to figure out what the true nature of induction is. If classical theory is valid, if even only partially, it will be part of the result. So what we need is a simple experiment that will expose the nature of electromagnetic induction. So where do we begin? Well, a, a loop of wire has three things that can be changed to see how inductance changes. One is the shape, which we all have been calling the area, but the shape and the area are inter, in, intimately related. One is the perimeter, the length of wire around the loop. And the other is the wire diameter, or wire cross-section. Thus, we should have an equation somehow we should come up with an equation where inductance is some function of of area or shape perimeter and wire cross section or wire diameter so and what we learned from the quad loop experiment with regard to the open loops not the the collapse loop is that we held the area and the perimeter constant and varied just the wire diameter this confirmed that inductance is not independent of wire thickness as classical theory tries to explain with the internal inductance derivation. So, because we're not sure what the something else is, even if it's really there, and since the something else seems to be a function of wire diameter and perimeter, we should like an experiment where these are held constant, allowing us to isolate the effects due to loop area or, or shape. So what kind of shape has a constant perimeter and a variable area? Well, that would be the rhombus. Now the rhombus we're going to use is going to be 18 inches on a side. It's too big to show in the video. But you can see as I vary the shape, the length of the sides are staying constant. If we put wire along the length of the sides of this rhombus, both the wire cross section or diameter and the length of the wire will not be changing as we change the area of the shape. So this is the ideal shape to be discerning what the nature of induction is with regard to the shape of the loop. And so um, what we want is we want the sides of this induct to be long enough so that the inductance is large enough to be accurately measured. Because when you get too low an inductance, it gets harder and harder to measure the inductance. And the other thing we want is we want to use 22 gauge wire. Basically we want the thickest wire that's still flexible enough to allow the rhombus to change without there being distortion due to the, you know, due to the wire not wanting to bend at the corners. So 22 gauge wire was found to be the best in my experiments 20 years ago so that's what we're going to use today. And 18 inches is what I used 20 years ago. So the basic idea is we're going to take a number of measurements okay, with different dimensions, uh, different values of dim 2. Like uh, Dim 1 is the length of a side, which is going to be 18 inches for our purposes. And then we're going to take different measurements, one at 25.25 uh, inches, and then 12.5, and these are pretty much arbitrary. And then 8 inches, 6, 4, and then 3 inches. You don't want to go too much narrower than that. Uh, because the ability to measure accurately the distance, the, as the distance gets smaller, your ability to accurately measure that small distance uh, degrades, and the effects from the other side coming close go up exponentially. So you don't want to get too close because it's you're going to have a lot of effects from one wire across the gap to the other that are going to be magnified as the distance goes to zero. So you don't want to get too close. So three inches across this distance here seems to be the optimal for the experiment. So how do we develop a theory, a new theory? Well, first we can reject the old concepts because they violate the rules of acquisition. For example, it violates, Faraday's law violates 
rule of acquisition number 17, which is the ambiguity tell. You know, like, well, how does that apply here? Well, again, using the X's to represent a magne magnetic field that's going down into the page, if I put a loop of wire in that magnetic field, well, according to Lenz's law, if that magnetic field is increasing into the page, then the current induced is going to try to oppose that field change. And therefore, around the outside of the wire, we're going to get an EMF that's going to be going counterclockwise around the outside of the wire. All right. So if I just move the loop here, that means the EMF at this point is going to go this way. But if I move the loop here, assuming that the magnetic field extends far out, then the EMF is going to be going in this direction. But if I move the loop here, then the EMF is going to be going in this direction. And if I put this part of the loop there, that means the EMF is going to be going in that direction. So what we're saying is that this is ambiguous because if there was no loop here, how is a charge going to know where to go? If charges are the basic building block of electromagnetic physics, then if a charge is in this magnetic field, it needs to know which way to go. It can't trust the fact that it might or might not be part of a loop to know which way it's supposed to be moving. So that's ambiguous. If it charges are the basic building blocks of electromagnetic physics, it can't be ambiguous where a single charge in a magnetic field can't know where to go when the magnetic field is changing. And in fact, the ambiguity tell uh, was developed from my early work 20 years ago. And then there's a disconnection tell. What bothers me is, well, how does a magnetic field flux line that's changing in intensity here affect the loop out here? It's disconnected. How does, how does the change affect over here? There's, that's a tell. That means there's something we're not, we don't know the full truth here. Okay, so we can basically throw Faraday's law out. There's got to be a better way to explain induction without this nonsense. Okay, so what does fit within the rules of acquisition? Well, if charges are both, if charges are the fundamental building block of electromagnetic theory and charges both generate or make, emit fields into space and react to electromagnetic fields, then any EM field model, any EM field model, must be reducible to an interaction just among charges. I should, become, I should be able to come up with a vector equation that says, well, if this guy is moving or accelerating or just standing still, it's going to be able to affect another charge across space in a known and discernible way. We should not have to rely on intermediate field products like they've done in the past. Because, I mean, think about it. How do we measure fields? We measure fields by putting charges in the way. Okay, so all these field models we have are not really true field models. They're there are mappings of how charges behave when contained in the field. So we've got to be able to reduce stuff down to a charge-to-charge -charge effect. So what we're going to do with the rhombus is because the charges in the loop of wire are going to be the things that emit the field into space. And what we can do is divide the entire length of the rhombus into tiny fragments, I'm going to call them, differential lengths of wire. And I'm going to call them fragments for shorthand notation. And then we know that as each fragment of wire, the current in each the charges in each fragment of wire accelerate, that's going to emit some kind of disturbance into space which is going to couple with the other parts of the wire. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to treat each fragment first start with a fragment and compute its effect to all the other fragments, then pick the next one, compute its effects to all the other fragments, connect, pick the next one, compute its effects to all the other fragments. And that's what we call in calculus a, would be a dual path integral. Now, I'm showing it's a dual closed path integral. It doesn't have to be. Uh, it's only because that's a symbol that I have for it, but it is definitely a path integral. And what we need to find out now is because we're going to be dis discerning the coupling from one fragment to another, we need to find out all the different ways or geometries in which a source fragment 
we're going to remember each one's going to be a source and each one's going to be a target, how one fragment affects another across space. So each fragment could have a differential length, and we're going to call the the one we're using for the source at any given time, we're going to call the source fragment. And the one that we're trying to compute the effects to, we're going to call the target fragment. R is the radial distance between the source and the target. And this vector has a magnitude and a direction. Each differential length, uh, uh, each fragment has a differential length and a, a direction. These really, these are angle, they should have been direction, but I used A for angle. And the target has a differential length and a direction. So now we're going to compute, so what we're going to do is once we do this dual line integral, treating each fragment as a source and each other fragment as a target, do it around the loop using a particular way that these geometries of one fragment reacting to another, we're going to come up with a shape factor S. Okay, and we're going to do that for each one of the experiments. Remember, we were going to take um, we were going to take the measurements of the rhombus, remember, we're going to vary dimension 2 by a number of different distances, and that's going to give us six measured values of inductance. Okay, then for each one of those measured values of inductance, we're going to compute the shape factor for any given geometry, which is going to give us six shape factors. Now let me give you an example of the geometry function. For example, we could say that the way one fragment relates to another in space is the sine of the angle between the target angle and the radial angle, which would be target angle minus radial angle, which would probably be this, uh, times the tangent of the target angle minus the source angle, which would be the be this angle here. I know it's a little convoluted, but that's the way we do it. Okay, and the number of geometries we can search to find the interaction between one fragment and another relies on a search table where we're going to take every possible way that all the angles could relate to each other. This actually goes down to, I think it's really uh, 18. I think I made a miscount there. And then the, how the distance relates to it. First of all, we can say that distance has no effect. Where distance has a t times 1 effect or distance squared effect, an inverse cube, inverse square, and just an inverse. Okay, now the reason why I did this, because early on when I did this data, I tried to do numerical or hand integration by trying to logically guess what the geometry interactions would be and trying to come up with an answer and I was way off the mark. My training actually held me back because I did not even consider that it would be an inverse, just a regular inverse. I was looking for an inverse square and that defeated me. My training defeated me and as Mark Twain said, don't let schooling interfere with your education. So after I failed miserably to try to do this logically and reasonably, my, in which my training held me back, I decided I better do a computer program and try everything. Because who knows how many different ways you can make this thing work. And that's why I came up with this computer ability. Is the computer is just going to take one from each list and then use that for uh, the geometry to compute the shape factor. Now, I'm going to show you a little bit how this all works together in a second. Uh, now, there's a, there is really only 7K unique permutations here. I'm not going to get into how that is. Um, there's there's 225,000. In, in the original one I made 20 years ago, there was f I added all kinds. Everything in the kitchen sink, it was 45,000 different unique permutations. But I've since cut it back because some of those were just redundant and outrageous. And, you know, I threw everything in. I said, might as well. It doesn't hurt. Computer's doing all the work. So the new software, which I'll be releasing, can, it has 25,000 permutations, but only really 7,000 are unique. And if you look at this table, and so what the, it's going to do, the computer is going to take one from each column and keep changing, going through every permutations of these columns. And these columns, like I said, go down to, I think it's, it's 18, to give you 25,000 total permutations, uh, where 7,000 are unique. And then what we're going to do is, so the way this goes, the way we're going to resolve this is we already have our measurements. That was what we got from the inductance meter. 
We have the shape factor that we're computing from the geometry. Remember, we're going to go through 25 or 7,000 different geometries and, and try it out for each, each set of measurement, or for the set of measurements. And the way I've set this up, as you can see, we have k unknown plus constant. Well, the reason for the rhombus keeping the distance or the perimeter constant is because we don't know what the self-induction is or the, the, other, the other thing that we're looking for. We don't know what that is. And also, we're going to have a little bit of extra inductance because of the, the leads and, um, and whatnot. So what we want to do is get the part that's related to the shape and multiply that by the constant of relation, whatever it is. We don't know. We can't trust that mu or km are, are valid here. I, I, we don't know that. And C is going to take up all of the other constants, which would be the inductance due to the internal inductance, which we're holding constant, or whatever that other thing is. That should work out as a constant because we're only changing the area, not the stuff related to the what, what should be that other thing. Okay, so for each data point we get from the inductance meter and each group of S's that we're going to compute using the geometry for each of the different dimensions of the loop. We're going to use uh, linear regression. Basically, this should plot as a, as a line plot here. You know, for, for uh, S1, S2, S3, da, da 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 we should have, it should plot out like this, L1, L2, L3, etc. So these should be linear on a line. So we can use linear regression to find the least noise fit of those data points. Where the constant of relation, k unknown, is going to be the slope of the line. And c is going to be the effects that are constant to the wire, which would be, at, uh, sh it would be the constant. OK, so now here's a pseudocode which is basically going to show you the, what the computer software is going to do. It's going to go through each one of the geometries, so each one of the 7,000 different geometries. It's going to pick one, and then it's going to go through each one of the six experiments. Remember, we got six different dimensions on the loop, and we got a unique measurement for each one of those. For each one of those dimensions of the loop, it's going to use the geometry and go through each fragment as a source and each fragment as a target. And it's going to compute and sum the fragment to a fragment effects to generate a, a shape factor. So once it's done computing a shape factor for every experiment based on the chosen geometry, then it's going to come down and do linear regression to find out what's the best fit for the constant of relation k theta, or which was going to be should come out to be km, and what the constant is, which would be should be whatever the internal or intrinsic inductance is. Then after it does that, it's going to go back and determine RMS error. And if the RMS error is below a certain threshold, then it's going to record the results. And the, right now, the threshold I've been using is 10 nanohenries. Then it's going to go on and try the next geometry. So this whole loop is going to repeat 7,000 or 7,000 times. OK, so that's where we're going. The next step is uh, EMF002H is how to build the rhombus. Uh, 2x is the experimental measuring the rhombus. 2s is the software where we're going to show the new induction search tool and show you how to enter the data that we measured. And then uh, EMF002R, we're going to review and, and draw the conclusion. And in here will be another tearing ceremony. Thank you very much.